Chapter One of Mount Royal, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mount Royal, Volume Three by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Recorded by Celine Major. Chapter One. With such remorseless speed, still come new woes. The next morning was damp and grey and mild, no autumn wind stirring the long sweeping branches of the cedars on the lawn, the dead leaves falling silently, the world all sad and solemn, clad in universal greyness. Christabel was up early with her boy in the nursery, watching him as he splashed about his bath and emerged rosy and joyous, like an infant river god sporting among the rushes. Early at family prayers in the dining room, a ceremony at which Mr. Tregonell rarely assisted, and to which Dopsy and Mopsy came flushed and breathless with hurry, anxious to pay all due respect to a hostess whom they hoped to visit again, but inwardly revolting against the unreasonableness of eight o'clock prayers. Angus, who was generally about the gardens before eight, did not appear at all this morning. The other men were habitually late breakfasting together in a free and easy manner when the ladies had left the dining-room so christabel miss bridgman and the miss vandeleurs sat down to breakfast alone dopsy giving little furtive glances at the door every now and then expectant of mr hamley's entrance that expectancy became too painful for the damsel's patience by and by as the meal advanced i wonder what has become of mr hamley she said this is the first time he has been late at breakfast "'Perhaps he is seeing to the packing of his portmanteau,' said Miss Bridgman. "'Some valets are bad packers and want superintendents.' "'Packing?' said Dopsy, aghast. "'Packing? What for?' "'He is going to London this afternoon. Didn't you know?' Dopsy grew pale as ashes. The shock was evidently terrible, and even Jessie pitied her. "'Poor silly Dop,' she thought. "'Could she actually suppose that she stood the faintest chance of bringing down her bird?' going away for good murmured miss vandeleur faintly all the flavour gone out of the dried salmon the cornish butter the sweet home-baked bread i hope so he is going to the south of france for the winter of course you know that he is consumptive and has not many years to live answered miss bridgman poor fellow sighed dopsy with tears glittering upon her lowered eyelids she had begun the chase moved chiefly by sordid instincts her tenderest emotions had been hacked and vulgarized by long experience in flirtation but at this moment she believed that never in her life had she loved before and that never in her life could she love again and if he dies unmarried what will become of his property inquired mopsy whose feelings were not engaged i haven't the faintest idea answered miss bridgman he has no near relations i hope he will leave his money to some charitable institution what time does he go faltered dopsy swallowing her tears mr hamley left an hour ago madam said the butler who had been carving at the sideboard during this conversation he has gone shooting the dog-cart is to pick him up at the gate leading to st nectan's kiev at eleven o'clock gone shooting on his last morning at mount royal exclaimed jessie that's a new development of mr hamley's character i never knew he had a passion for sport i believe there is a note for you ma'am said the butler to his mistress he went out into the hall and returned in a minute or two carrying a letter upon his official salver and handling it with official solemnity to mrs tregonell the letter was brief and commonplace enough dear mrs tregonell after all i am deprived of the opportunity of wishing you good-bye this morning by the temptation of two or three hours woodcock shooting about st nectan's kiev i shall drive straight from there to launceston in mr tregonell's dog-cart for the use of which i beg to thank him in advance i have already thanked you and miss bridgman for your goodness to me during my late visit to mount royal and can only say that my gratitude lies much deeper and means a great deal more than such expressions of thankfulness are generally intended to convey ever sincerely yours angus hamley then this was what leonard and he were settling last night thought christabel your master went out with mr hamley i suppose she said to the servant no ma'am my master is in his study i took him his breakfast an hour ago he is writing letters i believe and the other two gentlemen started for bodmin in the wagonette at six o'clock this morning they are going to see that unhappy man hanged said miss bridgman congenial occupation 
mr montague told me all about it at dinner yesterday and asked me if i wasn't sorry that my sex prevented my joining the party it would be a new sensation he said and to a woman of your intelligence that must be an immense attraction i told him i had no hankering after new sensations of that kind and he is really gone without saying good-bye to any of us said dopsy still harping on the departed guests yes he is really gone echoed jessie with a sigh christabel had been silent and absent-minded throughout the meal her mind was troubled she scarcely knew why disturbed by the memory of her husband's manner as he parted with angus in the corridor disturbed by the strangeness of this lonely expedition after woodcock in a man who had always shown himself indifferent to sport as usual with her when she was out of spirits she went straight to the nursery for comfort and tried to forget everything in life except that heaven had given her a son whom she adored her boy upon this particular morning was a little more fascinating and a shade more exacting than usual the rain soft and gentle as it was rather an all-pervading moisture than a positive rainfall forbade any open-air exercise for this tenderly reared young person so he had to be amused indoors he was just of an age to be played with and to understand certain games which called upon the exercise of a dawning imagination so it was his mother's delight to ramble with him in an imaginary wood and to fly from imaginary wolves lurking in dark caverns represented by the obscure regions underneath a table cover or to repose with him on imaginary mountain tops on the sofa or be engulfed with him in sofa pillows which stood for whelming waves then there were pictures to be looked at and little leo had to be lovingly instructed in the art of turning over a leaf without tearing it from end to end and the necessity for restraining an inclination to thrust all his fingers into his mouth between whiles and sprawl them admiringly on the page afterwards time so beguiled even on the dullest morning and with a lurking indefinite sense of trouble in her mind all the while went rapidly with christabel she looked up with surprise when the stable clock struck eleven so late do you know if the dog-cart has started yet carson yes ma'am i heard it drive out of the yard half an hour ago answered the nurse looking up from her needlework well i must go good-bye baby i think if you are very good you might have your dinner with mamma din din with mum 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 a kiss between every nonsense syllable you can bring him down nurse i shall have only the ladies with me at luncheon there were still further leave-takings and then christabel went downstairs on her way past her husband's study she saw the door standing ajar are you there leonard and alone yes she went in he was sitting at his desk his cheque-book open tradesmen's accounts spread out before him all the signs and tokens of business-like occupation it was not often that mr tregonell spent a morning in his study when he did it meant a general settlement of accounts and usually resulted in a surly frame of mind which lasted more or less for the rest of the day did you know that mr hamley had gone woodcock shooting naturally since it was i who suggested that he should have a shy at the birds before he left answered leonard without looking up he was filling in a check with his head bent over the table how strange for him to go alone in his weak health and with a fatiguing journey before him what's the fatigue of lolling in a railway carriage confound it you've made me spoil the cheque muttered leonard tearing the oblong slip of coloured paper across and across impatiently how your hand shakes have you been writing all the morning yes all the morning absently turning over the leaves of his cheque-book but you have been out your boots are all over mud yes i meant to have an hour or so at the birds i got as far as willow park and then remembered that clayton wanted the money for the tradesman to-day one must stick to one's pay-day don't you know when one has made a rule of course oh there are the new quarterlies said christabel seeing a package on the table do you mind my opening them here no as long as you hold your tongue and don't disturb me when i'm at figures this was not a very gracious permission to remain but christabel seated herself quietly by the fire and began to explore the two treasuries of wisdom which the day's post had brought leonard's study looked into the stable-yard a spacious quadrangle with long ranges of doors and windows saddle-rooms harness-rooms loose boxes coachman's and groom's quarters a little colony complete in itself from his open window the squire could give his orders interrogate his coachman as to his consumption of forage have an ailing horse paraded before him 
bully an underling and bestow praise or blame all round as it suited his humour here too were the kennels of the dogs whose company mr tregonell liked a little better than that of his fellow-men leonard sat with his head bent over the table writing christabel in her chair by the fire turning the leaves of her book in the rapture of a first skimming they sat thus for about an hour and then both looked up with a startled air at the sound of wheels it was the dog-cart that was being driven into the yard mr hamley's servant sitting behind walled in by a portmanteau and a gladstone bag leonard opened the window and looked out what's up he asked has your master changed his mind we haven't seen mr hamley sir there must have been some mistake i think we waited at the gate for nearly an hour and then baker said we'd better come back as we must have missed mr hamley somehow and he might be here waiting for us to take him to launceston baker's a fool how could you miss him if he went to the kiev there's only one way out of that place or only one way that mr hamley could find did you inquire if he went to the kiev yes sir baker went into the farmhouse and they told him that a gentleman had come with his gun and a dog and had asked for the key and had gone to the kiev alone they were not certain as to whether he'd come back or not but he hadn't taken the key back to the house he might have put it into his pocket and forgotten all about it don't you see sir after he'd let himself out of the gate that's what baker said and he might have come back here perhaps he has come back answered leonard carelessly you'd better inquire i don't think he can have returned said christabel standing near the window very pale how do you know asked leonard savagely you've been sitting here for the last hour poring over that book i think i should have heard i think i should have known faltered christabel with her heart beating strangely there was a mystery in the return of the carriage which seemed like the beginning of woe and horror like the ripening of that strange vague sense of trouble which had oppressed her for the last few hours you would have heard you would have known echoed her husband with brutal mockery by instinct by second sight by animal magnetism i suppose you are just the sort of woman to believe in that kind of rot the valet had gone across the yard on his way round to the offices of the house christabel made no reply to her husband's sneering speech but went straight to the hall and rang for the butler have you has any one seen mr hamley come back to the house she asked no ma'am inquire if you please of every one make quite sure that he has not returned and then let three or four men with nickels at their head go down to st necton's kiev and look for him i'm afraid there has been an accident i hope not ma'am answered the butler who had known christabel from her babyhood who had looked on a pleased spectator at mr hamley's wooing and whose heart was melted with tenderest compassion to-day at the sight of her pallid face and eyes made large with terror it's a dangerous kind of place for a stranger to go clambering about with a gun but not for one that knows every stone of it as mr hamley do send and at once please i do not think mr hamley having arranged for the dog-cart to meet him would forget his appointment there's no knowing ma'am some gentlemen are so wrapped up in their sport christabel sat down in the hall and waited while daniel the butler made his inquiries no one had seen mr hamley come in and everybody was ready to aver on oath if necessary that he had not returned so nichols the chief coachman a man of gumption and of much renown in the household as a person whose natural sharpness has been improved by the large responsibilities involved in a well-filled stable was brought to receive his orders from mrs tregonell daniel admired the calm gravity with which she gave the man his instructions despite her colourless cheek and the look of pain in every feature of her face you will take two or three of the stablemen with you and go as fast as you can to the kiev you had better go in the light cart and it would be as well to take a mattress and some pillows if if there should have been an accident those might be useful mr hamley left the house early this morning with his gun to go to the kiev and he was to have met the dog cart at eleven baker waited at the gate till twelve but perhaps you have heard yes ma'am baker told me it's strange but mr hamley may have overlooked the time if he had good sport do you know which of the dogs he took with him no why do you ask because i rather thought it was sambo sambo was always a favourite of mr hamley's though he's getting rather too old for his work now if it was sambo the dog must have run away and left him for he was back about the yard before ten o'clock he'd been hurt somehow for there was blood upon one of his feet master had the red setter with him this morning when he went for his stroll but i believe it must have been sambo that mr hamley took 
there was only one of the lads about the yard when he left for it was breakfast time and the little guffin didn't notice but if all the other dogs are in their kennels they aren't ma'am don't you see the two gentlemen took a couple of em to bodmin in the break and i don't know which sambo may have been with them and may have got tired of it and come home he's not a dog to appreciate that kind of thing go at once if you please nichols you know what to do yes ma'am nichols went his way and the gong began to sound for luncheon mr tregonell who rarely honoured the family with his presence at the midday meal came out of his den to-day in answer to the summons and found his wife in the hall i suppose you are coming in to luncheon he said to her in an angry aside you need not look so scared your old lover is safe enough i dare say i am not coming to luncheon she answered looking at him with pale contempt if you are not a little more careful of your words i may never break bread with you again the gong went on with its discordant clamour and jessie bridgman came out of the drawing-room with the younger miss vandeleur poor dopsy was shut in her own room with a headache she had been indulging herself with the feminine luxury of a good cry disappointment wounded vanity humiliation and a very real penchant for the man who had despised her attractions were the mingled elements in her cup of woe the nurse came down the broad oak staircase baby leonard toddling by her side and making two laborious jumps at each shallow step one on one off christabel met him picked him up in her arms and carried him back to the nursery where she ordered his dinner to be brought he was a little inclined to resist this change of plan at the first but was soon kissed into pleasantness and then the nurse was dispatched to the servants hall and christabel had her boy to herself and ministered to him and amused him for the space of an hour despite an aching heart then when the nurse came back mrs tregonell went to her own room and sat at the window watching the avenue by which the men must drive back to the house they did not come back till just when the gloom of the sunless day was deepening into starless night christabel ran down to the lobby that opened into the stable-yard and stood in the doorway waiting for nichols to come to her but if he saw her he pretended not to see her and went straight to the house by another way and asked to speak to mr tregonell christabel saw him hurry across the yard to that other door and knew that her fears were realized evil of some kind had befallen she went straight to her husband's study certain that she would meet nichols there leonard was standing by the fireplace listening while nichols stood a little way from the door relating the result of his search in a low agitated voice was he quite dead when you found him asked leonard when the man paused in his narration christabel stood just within the doorway half hidden in the obscurity of the room where there was no light but that of the low fire the door had been left ajar by nichols and neither he nor his master was aware of her presence yes sir dr blake said he must have been dead some hours had the gun burst no sir it must have gone off somehow perhaps the trigger caught in the handrail when he was crossing the wooden bridge and yet that seemed hardly possible for he was lying on the big stone at the other side of the bridge with his face downwards close to the water a horrible accident said leonard there'll be an inquest of course will blake give the coroner notice or must i dr blake said he'd see to that sir and he is lying at the farm yes sir we thought it was best to take the body there rather than to bring it home it would have been such a shock for my mistress and the other ladies dr blake said the inquest will be held at the inn at trevena well said leonard with a shrug and a sigh it's an awful business that's all that can be said about it lucky he has no wife or children no near relations to feel the blow all we can do is to show our respect for him now he is gone the body had better be brought home here after the inquest it will look more respectful for him to be buried from this house mrs tregonell's mind can be prepared by that time it is prepared already said a low voice out of the shadow i have heard all very sad isn't it replied leonard one of those unlucky accidents which occur every shooting season he was always a little awkward with a gun never handled one like a thoroughbred sportsman why did he go out shooting on the last morning of his visit asked christabel it was you who urged him to do it you who planned the whole thing i what nonsense you are talking i told him there were plenty of birds about the kiev just as i told the other fellows that will do nichols you did all that could be done 
go and get your dinner but first send a mounted groom to trevena to ask blake to come over here nichols bowed and retired shutting the door behind him he is dead then said christabel coming over to the hearth where her husband was standing he has been killed he has had the bad luck to kill himself as many a better sportsman than he has done before now answered leonard roughly if i could be sure of that leonard if i could be sure that his death was the work of accident i should hardly grieve for him knowing that he was reconciled to the idea of death and that if god had spared him this sudden end the close of his life must have been full of pain and weariness tears were streaming down her cheeks tears which she made no effort to restrain such tears as friendship and affection give to the dead tears that had no taint of guilt but leonard's jealous soul was stung to fury by those innocent tears why do you stand there snivelling about him he exclaimed do you want to remind me how fond you were of him and how little you ever cared for me do you suppose i am stone blind do you suppose i don't know you to the core of your heart if you know my heart you must know that it is as guiltless of sin against you and as true to my duty as a wife as you my husband can desire but you must know that or you would not have brought angus hamley to this house perhaps i wanted to try you to watch you and him together to see if the old fire was quite burnt out you could not be so base so contemptible there is no knowing what a man may be when he is used as i have been by you looked down upon from the height of a superior intellect a loftier nature told to keep his distance as a piece of vulgar clay hardly fit to exist beside that fine porcelain vase his wife do you think it was a pleasant spectacle for me to see you and angus hamley sympathizing and twaddling about browning's last poem or sighing over a sonata of beethoven's i who was outside all that kind of thing a bore a dolt to whom your fine sentiments and your flummery were an unknown language but i was only putting a case just now i liked hamley well enough in his way and i asked him here because i thought it was giving a chance to the vandeleur girls that was my motive and my only motive and he came and he is dead answered christabel in icy tones he went to that lonely place this morning at your instigation and he met his death there no one knows how no one ever will know at my instigation confound it christabel you have no right to say such things i told him it was a good place for woodcock and it pleased his fancy to try his luck there before he left lonely place be hanged it is a place to which every tourist goes it is as well known as the road to this house yet he was lying there for hours and no one knew if nichols had not gone he might be lying there still he may have lain there wounded his life-blood ebbing away dying by inches without help without a creature to succour or comfort him it was a cruel place a place where no help could come fortune of war answered leonard with a careless shrug a sportsman must die where his shot finds him there's many a day i might have fallen in the rockies and lain there for the lynxes and the polecats to pick my bones and i have walked shoulder to shoulder with death on mountain passes when every step on the crumbling track might send me sliding down to the bottomless pit below as for poor hamley well as you say yourself he was a doomed man a little sooner or later could not make much difference perhaps not said christabel gloomily going slowly to the door but i want to know how he died let us hope the coroner's inquest will make your mind easy on that point retorted her husband as she left the room End of chapter one Chapter Two of Mount Royal, Volume Three by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Yours on Monday, God's today. The warning gong sounded at half past seven as usual, and at eight the butler announced dinner. Captain Vandeleur and Mister Montague had returned from Bodmin, and they were grouped in front of the fire, talking in undertones with Mister Tregonell while christabel and the younger miss vandeleur sat on a sofa silent after a few murmured expressions of grief on the part of the latter lady it is like a dream sighed mopsy this being the one remark which a young person of her calibre inevitably makes upon such an occasion it is like a dreadful dream playing billiards last night and now dead 
it is too awful yes it is awful death is always awful answered christabel mechanically she had told herself that it was her duty to appear at the dinner-table to fulfil all her responsibilities as wife and hostess not to give any one the right to say that she was bemoaning him who had once been her lover and she was here to do her duty she wanted all the inhabitants of her little world to see that she mourned for him only as a friend grieves for the loss of a friend soberly with pious submission to the divine will that had taken him away for two hours she had remained on her knees beside her bed drowned in tears numbed by despair feeling as if life could not go on without him as if this heavily beating heart of hers must be slowly throbbing to extinction and then the light of reason had begun to glimmer through the thick gloom of grief and her lips had moved in prayer and as if in answer to her prayers came the image of her child to comfort and sustain her let me not dishonour my darling she prayed let me remember that i am a mother as well as a wife if i owe my husband very little i owe my son everything inspired by that sweet thought of her boy unwilling for his sake to give occasion for even the feeblest scandal she had washed the tears from her pale cheeks and put on a dinner-gown and had gone down to the drawing-room just ten minutes before the announcement of dinner she remembered how david when his beloved was dead had risen and washed and gone back to the business of life what use are my tears to him now he is gone she said to herself as she went downstairs miss bridgman was not in the drawing-room but mopsy was there dressed in black and looking very miserable i could not get poor dop to come down she said apologetically she has been lying on her bed crying ever since she heard the dreadful news she is so sensitive poor girl and she liked him so much and he had been so attentive to her i hope you'll excuse her please don't apologize i can quite imagine that this shock has been dreadful for her for every one in the house perhaps you would rather dine upstairs so as to be with your sister no answered mopsy taking christabel's hand with a touch of real feeling i had rather be with you you must feel his loss more than we can you had known him so much longer yes it is just five years since he came to mount royal five years is not much in the lives of some people but it seems the greater part of my life we will go away to-morrow said mopsy i am sure you'll be glad to get rid of us it will be a relief i mean perhaps at some future time you will let us come again for a little while we have been so intensely happy here then i shall be happy for you to come again next summer if we are here answered christabel kindly moved by mopsy's naivete one can never tell next year seems so far off in the hour of trouble dinner was announced and they all went in and made believe to dine in a gloomy silence broken now and then by dismal attempts at general conversation on the part of the men once mopsy took heart of grace and addressed her brother did you like the hanging jack she asked as if it were a play no it was hideous detestable i will never put myself in the way of being so tortured again the guillotine is swifter and more merciful i saw a man blown from a gun in india there were bits of him on my boots when i got home but it was not so bad as the hanging to-day the limp helpless figure swaying and trembling in the hangman's grip while they put the noose on the cap dragged roughly over the ghastly face the monotonous croak of the parson beating on like a machine while the poor wretch was being made ready for his doom it was all horrible to the last degree why can't we poison our criminals let them die comfortably as socrates died of a dose of some strong narcotic the parson might have some chance sitting by the dying man's bed in the quiet of his cell it would be much nicer said mopsy where's miss bridgman leonard asked suddenly looking round the table as if only that moment perceiving her absence she's not in her room sir mary thinks she has gone out answered the butler gone out after dark what can have been her motive for going out at such an hour asked leonard of his wife angrily i have no idea she may have been sent for by some sick person you know how good she is i know what a humbug she is retorted leonard daniel go and find out if any messenger came for miss bridgman or if she left any message for your mistress daniel went out and came back again in five minutes no one had seen any messenger no one had seen miss bridgman go out that's always the case here when i want to ascertain a fact growled leonard no one sees or knows anything 
there are twice too many servants for one to be decently served well it doesn't matter much miss bridgeman is old enough to take care of herself and if she walks off a cliff it will be her loss and nobody else's i don't think you ought to speak like that of a person whom your mother loved and who is my most intimate friend said christabel with grave reproach leonard had drunk a good deal at dinner and indeed there had been an inclination on the part of all three men to drown their gloomy ideas in wine while even mopsy who generally took her fair share of champagne allowed the butler to fill her glass rather oftener than usual sighing as she sipped the sparkling bright-coloured wine and remembering even in the midst of her regret for the newly dead that she would very soon have returned to a domicile where mouette was not the daily beverage nay where at times the very beer-barrel ran dry after dinner christabel went to the nursery it flashed upon her with acutest pain as she entered the room that when last she had been there she had not known of angus hamley's death he had been lying yonder by the waterfall dead and she had not known and now the fact of his death was an old thing part of the history of her life the time when he was alive and with her full of bright thoughts and poetic fancies seemed ever so long ago yet it was only yesterday yesterday and gone from her life as utterly as if it were an episode in the records of dead and gone ages as old as the story of tristan and isoult she sat with her boy till he fell asleep and sat beside him as he slept in the dim light of the night-lamp thinking of him who lay dead in the lonely farmhouse among those green hills they two had loved so well hushed by the voice of the distant sea sounding far inland in the silence of night she remembered how he had talked last night of the undiscovered country and how as he talked with flushed cheeks and two brilliant eyes she had seen the stamp of death on his face they had talked of the gates ajar a book which they had read together in the days gone by and which christabel had often returned to since that time a book in which the secrets of the future are touched lightly by a daring but a delicate hand a book which accepts every promise of the gospel in its most literal sense and overflows with an exultant belief in just such a heaven as poor humanity wants in this author's creed transition from death to life is instant death is the lucina of life there is no long lethargy of the grave there is no time of darkness straight from the bed of death the spirit rushes to the arms of the beloved ones who have gone before death so glorified becomes only the reunion of love he had talked of socrates and the faithful few who waited at the prison doors in the early morning when the sacred ship had returned and the end was near and of that farewell discourse in the upper chamber of the house at jerusalem which seems dimly foreshadowed by the philosopher's converse with his disciples at athens the struggle towards light at jerusalem the light itself in fullest glory christabel felt herself bound by no social duty to return to the drawing-room more especially as miss vandeleur had gone upstairs to sit with the afflicted dopsy who was bewailing the dead very sincerely in her own fashion with little bursts of hysterical tears and fragmentary remarks i know he didn't care a straw for me she gasped dabbing her temples with a handkerchief soaked in eau de cologne yet it seemed sometimes almost as if he did he was so attentive but then he had such lovely manners no doubt he was just as attentive to all girls oh mop if he had cared for me and if i had married him what a paradise this earth would have been mr tregonell told me that he had quite four thousand a year and thus and thus with numerous variations on the same theme poor dopsy mourned for the dead man while the low murmur of the distant sea beating for ever and for ever against the horned cliffs and dashing silvery white about the base of that mechard rock which looks like a couchant lion keeping guard over the shore sounded like a funeral chorus in the pauses of her talk it was half-past ten when christabel left her boy's bedside and on her way to her own room suddenly remembered jessie's unexplained absence she knocked at miss bridgman's door twice but there was no answer and then she opened the door and looked in expecting to find the room empty jessie was sitting in front of the fire in her hat and jacket staring at the burning coals there was no light in the room except the glow and flame of the fire but even in that cheerful light jessie looked deadly pale jessie exclaimed christabel going up to her and putting a gentle hand upon her shoulder for she took no notice of the opening of the door where in heaven's name have you been where should i have been 
surely you can guess i have been to see him to the farm alone at night alone at night yes i would have walked through storm and fire i would have walked through she set her lips like iron and muttered through her clenched teeth hell jesse jesse how foolish what good could it do none to him i know but perhaps a little to me i think if i had stayed here i should have gone stark raving mad i felt my brain reeling as i sat and thought of him in the twilight and then it seemed to me as if the only comfort possible was in looking at his dead face holding his dead hand and i have done it and am comforted a little she said with a laugh which ended in a convulsive sob my good warm-hearted jessie murmured christabel bending over her lovingly tears raining down her cheeks i know you always liked him always liked him echoed the other staring at the fire in blank tearless grief liked him yes always but you must not take his death so despairingly dear you know that under the fairest circumstances he had not very long to live we both knew that yes we knew it i knew thought i had realized the fact told myself every day that in a few months he would be hidden from us underground gone to a life where we cannot follow him even with our thoughts though we pretend to be so sure about it as those women do in the gates ajar i told myself this every day and yet now that he is snatched away suddenly cruelly mysteriously it is as hard to bear as if i had believed that he would live a hundred years i am not like you a piece of statuesque perfection i cannot say thy will be done when my dearest the only man i ever loved upon this wide earth is snatched from me does that shock your chilly propriety you who only half loved him and who broke his heart at another woman's bidding yes i loved him from the first loved him all the while he was your lover and found it enough for happiness to be in his company to see and hear him and answer every thought of his with sympathetic thoughts of mine understanding him quicker and better than you could bright as you are happy to go about with you too to be the shadow in the sunshine of your glad young lives just as a dog who loved him would have been happy following at his heels yes bell i loved him i think almost from the hour he came here in the sweet autumn twilight when i saw that poetic face half in fire-glow and half in darkness loved him always 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 and admired him as the most perfect among men jessie my dearest my bravest and you were so true and loyal you never by word or look betrayed what do you think of me cried jessie indignantly do you suppose that i would not rather have cut out my tongue thrown myself off the nearest cliff then give him one lightest occasion to suspect what a paltry-souled creature i was so weak that i could not cure myself of loving another woman's lover while he lived i hated myself for my folly now he is dead i glory in the thought of how i loved him how i gave him the most precious treasures of my soul my reverence my regard my tears and hopes and prayers those are the only gold and frankincense and myrrh which the poor of this earth can offer and i gave them freely to my divinity christabel laid her hand upon the passionate lips and kneeling by her friend's side comforted her with gentle caresses do you suppose i am not sorry for him jessie she said reproachfully after a long pause yes no doubt you are in your way but it is such an icy way would you have me go raving about the house i leonard's wife leo's mother i try to resign myself to god's will but i shall remember him till the end of my days with unspeakable sorrow he was like sunshine in my life so that life without him seemed all one dull grey till the baby came and brought me back to the sunlight and gave me new duties new cares yes you can find comfort in a baby's arms that is a blessing my comfort was to see my beloved in his bloody shroud shot through the heart shot through the heart well the inquest will find out something to-morrow i hope but i want you to go with me to-morrow morning as soon as it is light to the kiev what for 
to see the spot where he died what will be the good jessie i know the place too well it has been in my mind all this evening there will be some good perhaps at any rate i want you to go with me and if there ever was any reality in your love if you are not merely a beautiful piece of mechanism with a heart that beats by clockwork you will go if you wish it i will go as soon as it is light say at seven o'clock i will not go till after breakfast i want the business of the house to go on just as calmly as if this calamity had never happened i don't want any one to be able to say mrs tregonell is in despair at the loss of her old lover in fact you want people to suppose that you never cared for him they cannot suppose that when i was once so proud of my love all i want is that no one should think i loved him too well after i was a wife and mother i will give no occasion for scandal didn't i say that you were a handsome automaton i do not want any one to say hard things of me when i am dead hard things that my son may hear when you are dead you talk as if you thought you were to die soon you are of the stuff that wears to three score and ten and even beyond the psalmist's limit there is no friction for natures of your calibre when werther had shot himself charlotte went on cutting bread and butter don't you know it was her nature to be proper and good and useful and never to give offence her nature to cut bread and butter concluded jessie laughing bitterly christabel stayed with her for an hour talking to her consoling her speaking hopefully of that unknown world so fondly longed for so piously believed in by the woman who had learnt her creed at mrs tregonell's knees many tears were shed by christabel during that hour of mournful talk but not one by jessie bridgman hers was a dry-eyed grief after breakfast then we will walk to the kiev said jessie as christabel left her would it be too much to ask you to make it as early as you can i will go the moment i am free good night dear End of chapter two Chapter Three of Mount Royal, Volume Three by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Duel or Murder. All the household appeared at breakfast next morning. Even poor Dopsy, who felt that she could not nurse her grief in solitude any longer, it's behaving too much as if you were his widow. Mopsy had told her somewhat harshly and then there was the task of packing since they were to leave mount royal at eleven in order to be at launceston in time for the one o'clock train this morning's breakfast was less silent than the dinner of yesterday everybody felt as if mr hamley had been dead at least a week captain vandeleur and mr montague discussed the sad event openly as if the time for reticence were past speculated and argued as to how the accident could have happened talked learnedly about guns wondered whether the country surgeon was equal to the difficulties of the case i can't understand said mr montague if he was found lying in the hollow by the waterfall how his gun came to go off if he had been going through a hedge or among the brushwood on the slope of the hill it would be easy enough to see how the thing might have happened but as it is i'm all in the dark you had better go and watch the inquest and make yourself useful to the coroner sneered leonard who had been drinking his coffee in moody silence until now you seem to think yourself so uncommonly clever and far-seeing well i flatter myself i know as much about sport as most men and i've handled a gun before to-day and know that the worst gun that was ever made won't go off and shoot a fellow through the heart without provocation of some kind who said he was shot through the heart somebody did one of your people i think mrs tregonell sat at the other end of the table half hidden by the large old-fashioned silver urn and next to her sat jessie bridgman a spare small figure in a close-fitting black gown a pale drawn face with a look of burnt-out fires pale as the crater when the volcanic forces have exhausted themselves at a look from christabel she rose and they two left the room together five minutes later they had left the house and were walking towards the cliff by following which they could reach the kiev without going down into beaucastle it was a wild walk for a windy autumn day but these two loved its wildness had walked here in many a happy hour with souls full of careless glee now they walked silently swiftly looking neither to the sea nor the land though both were at their loveliest in the shifting lights and shadows of an exquisite october morning sunshine enough to make one believe it was summer 
breezes enough to blow about the fleecy clouds in the blue clear sky to ripple the soft dun-coloured heather on the hillocky common and to give life and variety to the sea it was a long walk but the length of the way seemed of little account to these two christabel had only the sense of a dreary monotony of grief time and space had lost their meaning this dull aching sorrow was to last for ever till the grave broken only by brief intervals of gladness and forgetfulness with her boy to-day she could hardly keep this one source of consolation in her mind all her thoughts were centred upon him who lay yonder dead jessie she said suddenly laying her hand on her companion's wrist as they crossed the common above the slate quarry seaward of trevalga village with its little old church and low square tower jessie i am not going to see him what weak stuff you are made of muttered jessie contemptuously turning to look into the white frightened face no you are not going to look upon the dead you would be afraid and it might cause scandal no you are only going to see the place where he died and then perhaps you or i will see a little further into the darkness that hides his fate you heard how those men were puzzling their dull brains about it at breakfast even they can see that there is a mystery what do you mean only as much as i say i know nothing yet but you suspect yes my mind is full of suspicion but it is all guesswork no shred of evidence to go upon they came out of a meadow into the high road presently the pleasant rustic road which so many happy holiday-making people tread in the sweet summer time the way to that wild spot where england's first hero was born the englishman's troy cradle of that fair tradition out of which grew the englishman's iliad beside the gate through which they came lay that mighty slab of spar which has been christened king arthur's quoit but which the rector of trevalga declared to be the covering-stone of a cromlech christabel remembered how facetious they had all been about arthur and his game of quoits five years ago in the bright autumn weather when the leaves were blown about so lightly in the warm west wind and now the leaves fell with a mournful heaviness and every falling leaf seemed an emblem of death they went to the door of the farmhouse to get the key of the gate which leads to the kiev christabel stood in the little quadrangular garden looking up at the house while jessie rang and asked for what she wanted did no one except mr hamley go to the kiev yesterday until the men went to look for him she asked of the young woman who brought her the key no one else miss no one but him had the key they found it in the pocket of his shooting jacket when he was brought here involuntarily jessie put the key to her lips his hand was almost the last that had touched it just as they were leaving the garden where the last of the yellow dahlias were fading christabel took jessie by the arm and stopped her in which room is he lying she asked can we see the window from here yes it is that one jessie pointed to a low latticed window in the old grey house a casement round which myrtle and honeysuckle clung lovingly the lattice stood open the soft sweet air was blowing into the room just faintly stirring the white dimity curtain and he was lying there in that last ineffable repose they went up the steep lane between tall tangled hedges where the ragged robin still showed his pinky blossoms and many a pale yellow hawksweed enlivened the faded foliage while the ferns upon the banks wet from yesterday's rain still grew rankly green on the crest of the hill the breeze grew keener and the dead leaves were being ripped from the hedgerows and whirled down into the hollow where the autumn wind seemed to follow christabel and jessie as they descended with a long plaintive minor cry like the lament at an irish funeral all was dark and desolate in the green valley as jessie unlocked the gate and they went slowly down the steep slippery path among moss-grown rock and drooping fern down and down by sharply winding ways so narrow that they could only go one by one till they came within the sound of the rushing water and then down into the narrow cleft where the waterfall tumbles into a broad shallow bed and dribbles away among green slimy rocks here there is a tiny bridge a mere plank that spans the water with a handrail on one side they crossed this and stood on the broad flat stone on the other side this is the very heart of st necton's mystery here high in the air the water pierces the rock and falls a slender silvery column into the rocky bed below look said jessie bridgman pointing down at the stone there were marks of blood upon it 
the traces of stains which had been roughly wiped away by the men who found the body this is where he stood said jessie looking round and then she ran suddenly across to the narrow path on the other side and some one else stood here here just at the end of the bridge there are marks of other feet here those are the men who came to look for him said christabel yes that makes it difficult to tell there are the traces of many feet yet i know she muttered with clenched teeth that some one stood here just here and shot him they were standing face to face see she stepped the bridge with light swift feet so at ten paces don't you see christabel looked at her with a white scared face remembering her husband's strange manner the night before last and those parting words at mr hamley's bedroom door you understand my plan perfectly it saves all trouble don't you see those few words had impressed themselves upon her memory insignificant as they were because of something in the tone in which they were spoken something in the manner of the two men you mean she said slowly with her hand clenching the rail of the bridge seeking unconsciously for support you mean that angus and my husband met here by appointment and fought a duel that is my reading of the mystery here in this lonely place without witnesses my husband murdered him they would not count it murder fate might have been the other way your husband might have been killed no cried christabel passionately angus would not have killed him that would have been too deep a dishonour she stood silent for a few moments white as death looking round her with wide despairing eyes he has been murdered she said in hoarse faint tones that suspicion has been in my mind dark shapeless horrible from the first he has been murdered and i am to spend the rest of my life with his murderer then with a sudden hysterical cry she turned angrily upon jessie how dare you tell lies about my husband she exclaimed don't you know that nobody came here yesterday except angus no one else had the key the girl at the farm told us so the key echoed jessie contemptuously do you think a gate breast high would keep out an athlete like your husband besides there is another way of getting here without going near the gate where he might be seen perhaps by some farm labourer in the field the men were ploughing there yesterday and heard a shot they told me that last night at the farm wait wait cried jessie excitedly she rushed away light as a lapwing flying across the narrow bridge bounding from stone to stone vanishing amidst dark autumn foliage christabel heard her steps dying away in the distance then there was an interval of some minutes during which christabel hardly caring to wonder what had become of her companion stood clinging to the handrail and staring down at stones and shingle feathery ferns soddened logs the water rippling and lapping round all things crystal clear then startled by a voice above her head she looked up and saw jessie's light figure just as she dropped herself from the sharp arch of rock and scrambled through the cleft hanging on by her hands finding a foothold in the most perilous places in danger of instant death my god murmured christabel with clasped hands not daring to cry aloud lest she should increase jessie's peril she will be killed with a nervous grip and a muscular strength which no one could have supposed possible in so slender a frame jessie bridgman made good her descent and stood on the shelf of slippery rock below the waterfall unhurt save for a good many scratches and cuts upon the hands that had clung so fiercely to root and bramble crag and boulder what i could do your husband could do she said he did it often when he was a boy you must remember his boasting of it he did it yesterday look at this this was a ragged narrow shred of heather cloth with a brick dust red tinge in its dark warp which leonard had much affected this year mr tregonell's colour is it not asked jessie yes it is like his coat like it is a part of his coat i found it hanging on a bramble at the top of the cleft try if you can find the coat when you get home and see if it is not torn but most likely he will have hidden the clothes he wore yesterday murderers generally do how dare you call him a murderer said christabel trembling and cold to the heart it seemed to her as if the mild autumnal air here in the sheltered nook which was always warmer than the rest of the world 
had suddenly become an icy blast that blew straight from faraway arctic seas how dare you call my husband a murderer oh i forgot it was a duel i suppose a fair fight planned so skilfully that the result should seem like an accident and the survivor should run no risk still to my mind it was murder all the same for i know who provoked the quarrel yes and you know you who are his wife and who for respectability's sake will try to shield him you know for you must have seen hatred and murder in his face that night when he came into the drawing-room and asked mr hamley for a few words in private it was then he planned this work pointing to the broad level stone against which the clear water was rippling with such a pretty playful sound while those two women stood looking at each other with pale intent faces fixed eyes and tremulous lips and angus hamley who valued his brief remnant of earthly life so lightly consented reluctantly perhaps but too proud to refuse and he fired in the air yes i know he would not have injured your husband by so much as a hair of his head i know him well enough to be sure of that he came here like the victim to the altar leonard tregonell must have known that and i say that though he with his mexican freebooter's morality may have called it a fair fight it was murder deliberate diabolical murder if this is true said christabel in a low voice i will have no mercy upon him oh yes you will you will sacrifice feeling to propriety you will put a good face upon things for the sake of your son you were born and swaddled in the purple of respectability you will not stir a finger to avenge the dead i will have no mercy upon him repeated christabel with a strange look in her eyes End of chapter three chapter four of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four dust to dust the inquest at the warncliffe arms was conducted in a thoroughly respectable unsuspicious manner no searching questions were asked no inferences drawn to the farmers and tradespeople who constituted that rustic jury the case seemed too simple to need any severe interrogation a gentleman staying in a country house goes out shooting and is so unlucky as to shoot himself instead of the birds whereof he went in search he is found with an empty bag and a charge of swan shot through his heart hard lines as jack vandeleur observed sotto voce to a neighbouring squire while the inquest was pursuing its sleepy course and about the queerest fluke i ever saw on any table was it a fluke muttered little montague lifting himself on tiptoe to watch the proceedings he and his companions were standing among a little crowd at the door of the justice-room it looks to me uncommonly as if mr hamley had shot himself we all know he was deadly sweet on mrs t although both of them behaved beautifully men have died and worms have eaten them but not for love quoted captain vandeleur who had a hearsay knowledge of shakespeare though he had never read a shakespearean play in his life if hamley was so dead tired of life that he wanted to kill himself he could have done it comfortably in his own room he might wish to avoid the imputation of suicide pshaw how can any man care what comes afterwards bury me where four roads meet with a stake through my body or in westminster abbey under a marble monument and the result is just the same to me that's because you are an out-and-out -out bohemian but hamley was a dandy in all things he would be nice about the details of his death mr hamley's valet was now being questioned as to his master's conduct and manner on the morning he left mount royal the man replied that his master's manner had been exactly the same as usual he was always very quiet said no more than was necessary to be said he was a kind master but never familiar he never made a companion of me said the man though i'd been with him at home and abroad twelve years but a better master never lived he was always an early riser there was nothing out of the way in his getting up at six and going out at seven there was only one thing at all out of the common and that was his attending to his gun himself instead of telling me to get it ready for him had he many guns with him only two the one he took was an old gun a favourite do you know why he took swan shot to shoot woodcocks no unless he made a mistake in the charge he took the cartridges out of the case himself and put them into his pocket he was an experienced sportsman 
though he was never as fond of sport as the generality of gentlemen do you know if he had been troubled in mind of late no i don't think he had any trouble on his mind he was in very bad health and knew that he had not long to live but he seemed quite happy and contented indeed judging by what i saw of him i should say that he was in a more easy contented frame of mind during the last few months than he had ever been for the last four years this closed the examination there had been very few witnesses called only the medical man the men who had found the body the girl at the farm who declared that she had given the key to mr hamley a little before eight that morning that no one else had asked for the key till the men came from mount royal that to her knowledge no one but the men at work on the farm had gone up the lane that morning a couple of farm labourers gave the same testimony they had been at work in the topmost field all the morning and no one had gone to the kiev that way except the gentleman that was killed they had heard a shot or two shots they were not certain which fired between eight and nine they were not very clear as to the hour and they could not say for certain whether they heard one or two shots but they knew that the report was a very loud one unusually loud for a sportsman's shot mr tregonell although he was in the room ready to answer any questions was not interrogated the jury went in a wagonette to see the body which was still lying at the farm and returned after a brief inspection of that peaceful clay the countenance wearing that beautiful calm which is said to be characteristic of death from a gunshot wound to give their verdict death by misadventure the body was carried to mount royal after dark and three days later there was a stately funeral to which first cousins and second cousins of the dead came as far from the four corners of the earth for angus hamley dying a bachelor and leaving a handsome estate behind him was a person to be treated with all those last honours which affectionate kindred can offer to poor humanity he was buried in the little churchyard in the hollow where christabel and he had heard the robin singing and the dull thud of the earth thrown out of an open grave in the calm autumn sunlight now in the autumn his own grave was dug in the same peaceful spot in accordance with a note which his valet who knew his habits found in a diary october eleventh if i should die in cornwall and there are times when i feel as if death were nearer than my doctor told me at our last interview i should like to be buried in minster churchyard i have outlived all family associations and i should like to lie in a spot which is dear to me for its own sake a will had been found in mr hamley's dispatch-box which receptacle was opened by his lawyer who came from london on purpose to take charge of any papers which his client might have in his possession at the time of his death the bulk of his papers were no doubt in his chambers in the albany chambers which he had taken on coming of age and which he had occupied at intervals ever since mr tregonell showed himself keenly anxious that everything should be done in a strictly legal manner and it was by his own hand that the lawyer was informed of his client's death and invited to mount royal mr bryanstone the solicitor a thorough man of the world and an altogether agreeable person appeared at the manor-house two days before the funeral and being empowered by mr tregonell to act as he pleased sent telegrams far and wide to the dead man's kindred who came trooping like carrion crows to the funeral feast angus hamley was buried in the afternoon a mild peaceful afternoon at the end of october with a yellow light in the western sky which deepened and brightened as the funeral train wound across the valley climbed the steep street of Bocastle, and then wound slowly downwards into the green heart of the hill to the little rustic burial-place that orb of molten gold was sinking behind the edge of the moor just when the vicar read the last words of the funeral service golden and crimson gleams touched the landscape here and there golden light still lingered on the sea as the mourners so thoroughly formal and conventional for the most part jack vandeleur and little mounty amidst the train with carefully composed features went back to their carriages and then the shades of evening came slowly down and spread a dark pall over hillside and hedgerow and churchyard where there was no sound but the monotonous fall of the earth which the gravedigger was shoveling into that new grave there had been no women at the funeral those two who each after her own peculiar fashion had loved the dead man were shut in their own rooms thinking of him picturing with too vivid imagery the lowering of the coffin in the new-made grave hearing the solemn monotony of the clergyman's voice sounding clear in the clear air the first shovelful of earth falling on the coffin lid dust to dust dust to dust lamps were lighted in the drawing-room where the will was to be read 
a large wood fire burned brightly pleasant after the lowered atmosphere of evening wines and other refreshments stood on a table near the hearth another table stood ready for the lawyer so far as there could be or ought to be comfort and cheeriness on so sad an occasion comfort and cheeriness were here the cousins first and second warmed themselves before the fire and discoursed in low murmurs of the time and the trouble it had cost them each to reach this out-of-the-way hole and discuss the means of getting away from it mr tregonell stood on one side of the hearth leaning his broad back heavily against the sculptured chimney-piece and listening moodily to captain vandeleur's muttered discourse he had insisted upon keeping his henchman with him during this gloomy period sending an old servant as far as plymouth to see the miss vandeleurs into the london train rather than part with his familiar friend even mr montagu who had delicately hinted at departure was roughly bidden to remain i shall be going away myself in a week or so said mr tregonell i don't mean to spend the winter at this fag end of creation it will be time enough for you to go when i go the friends enjoying free quarters which were excellent in their way and having no better berths in view freely forgave the bluntness of the invitation and stayed but they commented between themselves in the seclusion of the smoking-room upon the squire's disinclination to be left without cheerful company he's infernally nervous that's what it all means said little monty who had all that cock-sparrowish pluck which small men are wont to possess the calm security of insignificance you wouldn't suppose a great burly fellow like tregonell who has travelled all over the world would be scared by a death in this house would you death is awful let it come when it will answered jack vandeleur dubiously i've seen plenty of hard hitting in the hill country but i'd go a long way to avoid seeing a strange dog die let alone a dog i was fond of tregonell couldn't have been very fond of hamley that's certain said monty they seem good friends seemed yes but do you suppose tregonell ever forgot that mr hamley and his wife had once been engaged to be married it isn't in human nature to forget that kind of thing and he made believe that he asked hamley here to give one of your sisters a chance of getting a rich husband said monty rolling up a cigarette as he sat adroitly balanced on the arm of a large chair and shaking his head gently with lowered eyelids and a cynical smile curling his thin lips that was a little too thin he asked hamley here because he was savagely jealous and suspected his motive for turning up in this part of the country and wanted to see how he and mrs tregonell would carry on whatever he wanted i'm sure he saw no harm in either of them said captain vandeleur i'm as quick as any man at twigging that kind of thing and i'll swear that it was all fair and above board with those two they behaved beautifully so they did poor things answered monty in his little purring way and yet tregonell wasn't happy he'd have been better pleased if hamley had proposed to my sister as he ought to have done said vandeleur trying to look indignant at the memory of dopsy's wrongs now drop that old van said monty laughing softly and pleasantly as he lit his cigarette and began to smoke dreamily daintily like a man for whom smoking is a fine art sink your sister as i said before that's too thin dopsy is a dear little girl one of the five or six and twenty nice girls whom i passionately adore but she was never anywhere within range of hamley first and foremost she isn't his style and secondly he has never got over the loss of mrs tregonell he behaved beautifully while he was here but he was just as much in love with her as he was four years ago when i used to meet them at dances a regular pair of arcadian lovers daphne and chloe and that kind of thing she only wanted a crook to make the picture perfect and now mr bryanstone had hummed and hawed a little and had put on a pair of gold-rimmed spectacles and cousins near and distant ceased their conversational undertones and seated themselves conveniently to listen the will was brief to percy ritherton commander in her majesty's navy my first cousin and old schoolfellow in memory of his dear mother's kindness to one who had no mother i bequeathed ten thousand pounds and my sapphire ring which has been an heirloom and which i hope he will leave to any son of his whom he may call after me to my servant john danby five hundred pounds in consuls to my housekeeper in the albany two hundred and fifty to james bryanstone my very kind friend and solicitor of lincoln's inn my collection of gold and silver snuff-boxes and roman intaglios 
all the rest of my estate real and personal to be vested in trustees of whom the above-mentioned james bryanstone shall be one and the rev john carlion of trevena cornwall the other for the sole use and benefit of leonard george tregonell now an infant who shall with his father and mother's consent assume the name of hamley after that of tregonell upon coming of age and i hope that his father and mother will accept this legacy for their son in the spirit of pure friendship for them and attachment to the boy by which it is dictated and that they will suffer their son so to perpetuate the name of one who will die childless there was an awful silence perfect collapse on the part of the cousins the one kinsman selected for benefaction being now with his ship in the mediterranean and then leonard tregonell rose from his seat by the fire and came close up to the table at which mr bryanstone was sitting am i at liberty to reject that legacy on my son's part he asked certainly not the money is left in trust your son can do what he likes when he comes of age but why should you wish to decline such a legacy left in such friendly terms mr hamley was your friend he was my mother's friend for me only a recent acquaintance it seems to me that there is a sort of indirect insult in such a bequest as if i were unable to provide for my boy as if i were likely to run through everything and make him a pauper before he comes of age believe me there is no such implication said the lawyer smiling blandly at the look of trouble and anger in the other man's face did you never hear before of money being left to a man who already has plenty that is a general bent of all legacies in this world it is the poor who are sent empty away murmured mr bryanstone with a sly glance under his spectacles at the seven blank faces of the seven cousins i consider that mr hamley who was my very dear friend has paid you the highest compliment in his power and that you have every reason to honour his memory and legally i have no power to refuse his property certainly not the estate is not left to you you have no power to touch a sixpence of it and the will is dated just three weeks ago within the first week of his visit here he must have taken an inordinate fancy to my boy mr bryanstone smiled to himself softly with lowered eyelids as he folded up the will a holograph will upon a single sheet of bath post witnessed by two of the mount royal servants the family solicitor knew all about angus hamley's engagement to miss courtenay had even received instructions for drawing the marriage settlement but he was too much a man of the world to refer to that fact was not mr hamley's father engaged to your mother he asked yes then don't you think that respect for your mother may have had some influence with mr hamley when he made your son his heir i am not going to speculate about his motives i only wish he had left his money to an asylum for idiots or to his cousins with a glance at the somewhat vacuous countenances of the dead man's kindred or that i were at liberty to decline his gift which i should do flatly this sounds as if you were prejudiced against my lamented friend i thought you liked him so i did stammered leonard but not well enough to give him the right to patronize me with his d blank legacy mr tregonell said the lawyer frowning i have to remind you that my late client has left you individually nothing and i must add that your language and manner are most unbefitting this melancholy occasion leonard grumbled an inaudible reply and walked back to the fireplace the whole of this conversation had been carried on in undertones so that the cousins who had gathered in a group upon the hearth-rug and who were for the most part absorbed in pensive reflections upon the futility of earthly hopes heard very little of it they belonged to that species of well-dressed nonentities more or less impecunious which sometimes constitute the outer fringe upon a good old family to each of them it seemed a hard thing that angus hamley had not remembered him individually choosing him out of the ruck of cousinship as a meet object for bounty he ought to have left me an odd thousand murmured a beardless subaltern he knew how badly i wanted it for i borrowed a pony of him the last time he asked me to breakfast and a man of good family must be very hard up when he comes to borrowing ponies i dare say you would have not demurred to making it a monkey if mr hamley had proposed it said his interlocutor of course not and if he had been generous he would have given me something handsome instead of being so confoundly literal as to write to his cheque for exactly the amount i asked for a man of his means and age ought to have had more feeling for a young fellow in his first season and now i am out of pocket for my expenses to this infernal hole 
thus and with other wailings of an approximate character did angus hamley's kindred make their lamentation and then they all began to arrange among themselves for getting away as early as possible next morning and for travelling together with a distant idea of a little nap to beguile the weariness of the way between plymouth and paddington there was room enough for them all at mount royal and mr tregonell was not a man to permit any guest howsoever assembled to leave his house for the shelter of an inn so the cousins stayed dined heavily smoked as furiously as those furnace chimneys which are supposed not to smoke all the evening and thought they were passing virtuous for refraining from the relaxation of pool or shell-out opining that the click of the balls might have an unholy sound so soon after a funeral debarred from this amusement they discussed the career and character of the dead man and were all agreed in the friendliest spirit that there had been very little in him and that he had made a poor thing of his life and obtained a most inadequate amount of pleasure out of his money mount royal was clear of them all by eleven o'clock next morning mr montague went away with them and only captain vandeleur remained to bear leonard company in a house which now seemed given over to gloom christabel kept her room with jessie bridgman in constant attendance upon her she had not seen her husband since her return from the kiev and jessie had told him in a few resolute words that it would not be well for them to meet she is very ill said jessie standing on the threshold of the room while leonard remained in the corridor outside dr hale has seen her and he says she must have perfect quiet no one is to worry her no one is to talk to her the shock she has suffered in this dreadful business has shattered her nerves why can't you say in plain words that she is grieving for the only man she ever loved asked leonard i am not going to say that which is not true and which you better than any one else know is not true it is not angus hamley's death but the manner of his death which she feels take that to your heart mr tregonell you are a viper said leonard and you always were a viper tell my wife when she is well enough to hear reason that i am not going to be sat upon by her or her toady and that as she is going to spend her winter dissolved in tears for mr hamley's death i shall spend mine in south america with jack vandeleur three days later his arrangements were all made for leaving cornwall captain vandeleur was very glad to go with him upon what he jack pleasantly called reciprocal terms mr tregonell paying all expenses as a set-off against his friend's cheerful society there was no false pride about poker vandeleur no narrow-minded dislike to being paid for he was so thoroughly assured as to the perfect equitableness of the transaction on the morning he left mount royal mr tregonell went into the nursery to bid his son good-bye he contrived by some mild artifice to send the nurse on an errand and while she was away strained the child to his breast and hugged and kissed him with a rough fervour which he had never before shown the boy quavered a little and his lip drooped under that rough caress and then the clear blue eyes looked up and saw that this vehemence meant love and the chubby arms clung closely round the father's neck poor little beggar muttered leonard his eyes clouded with tears i wonder whether i shall ever see him again he might die or i there is no telling hard lines to leave him for six months on end but with a suppressed shudder i should go mad if i stayed here the nurse came back and leonard put the child on his rocking-horse which he had left reluctantly at the father's entrance and left the nursery without another word in the corridor he lingered for some minutes now staring absently at the family portraits now looking at the door of his wife's room he had been occupying a bachelor room at the other end of the house since her illness should he force an entrance to that closed chamber defy jesse bridgman and take leave of his wife the wife whom after the bent of his own nature he had passionately loved what could he say to her very little in his present mood what would she say to him there was the rub from that pale face from those uplifted eyes almost as innocent as the eyes that had looked at him just now he shrank in absolute fear at the last moment after he had put on his overcoat and when the dog-cart stood waiting for him at the door he sat down and scribbled a few hasty lines of farewell i am told you are too ill to see me but cannot go without one word of good-bye if i thought you cared a rap for me i should stay but i believe you have set yourself against me because of this man's death and that you will get well all the sooner for my being far away perhaps six months hence when i come back again if i don't get killed out yonder which is always on the cards 
you may have learnt to feel more kindly towards me god knows i have loved you as well as ever man loved woman too well for my own happiness good-bye take care of the boy and don't let that little viper jessie bridgman poison your mind against me lanard are you coming to-day or to-morrow cried jack vandeleur's stentorian voice from the hall we shall lose the train at launceston if you don't look sharp thus summoned leonard thrust his letter into an envelope directed it to his wife and gave it to daniel who was hovering about to do due honour to his master's departure the master for whose infantine sports he had made his middle-aged back as the back of a horse and perambulated the passages on all fours twenty years ago the master who seemed but too likely to bring his grey hairs with sorrow to the grave judging by the pace at which he now appeared to be travelling along the road to ruin End of chapter four chapter five of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five pain for thy girdle and sorrow upon thy head now came a period of gloom and solitude at mount royal mrs tregonell lived secluded in her own rooms rarely leaving them save to visit her boy in his nursery or to go for long lonely rambles with miss bridgman the lower part of the house was given over to silence and emptiness it was winter and the roads were not inviting for visitors so after a few calls had been made by neighbours who lived within ten miles or so and those callers had been politely informed by daniel that his mistress was confined to her room by a severe cough and was not well enough to see any one no more carriages drove up the long avenue and the lodge-keeper's place became a sinecure save for opening the gate in the morning and shutting it at dusk mrs tregonell neither rode nor drove and the horses were only taken out of their stables to be exercised by grooms and underlings the servants fell into the way of living their own lives almost as if they had been on board wages in the absence of the family the good old doctor who had attended christabel in all her childish illnesses came twice a week and stayed an hour or so in the morning-room upstairs closeted with his patient and her companion and then looked at little leo in his nursery that young creature growing and thriving exceedingly amidst the gloom and silence of the house and awakening the echoes occasionally with bursts of baby mirth none of the servants knew exactly what was amiss with mrs tregonell jessie guarded and fenced her in with such jealous care hardly letting any other member of the household spend five minutes in her company they only knew that she was very white very sad-looking that it was with the utmost difficulty she was persuaded to take sufficient nourishment to sustain life and that her only recreation consisted in those long walks with jessie walks which she took in all weathers and sometimes at the strangest hours the people about boscastle grew accustomed to the sight of these two solitary women clad in dark cloth ulsters with close-fitting felt hats that defied wind and weather armed with sturdy umbrellas tramping over fields and commons by hilly paths through the winding valley where the stream ran loud and deep after the autumn rains on the cliffs above the wild grey sea always avoiding as much as possible all beaten tracks and the haunts of mankind those who did meet the two reported that there was something strange in the looks and ways of both they did not talk to each other as most ladies talked to beguile the way they marched on in silence the younger fairer face pale as death and inexpressibly sad and with a look as of one who walks in her sleep with wide open unseeing eyes she looks just like a person who might walk over the cliff if there was no one by to take care of her said mrs penny the butcher's wife who had met them one day on her way home from camelford market but miss bridgman she do take such good care and she do watch every step of young mrs tregonell's christabel was always spoken of as young mrs tregonell by those people who had known her aunt i'm afraid the poor dear lady has gone a little wrong in her head since mr hamley shot himself and there are some as do think he shot himself for her sake never having got over her marrying our squire on many a winter evening when the sea ran high and wild at the foot of the rocky promontory and overhead a wilder sky seemed like another tempestuous sea inverted those two women paced the grass-grown hill at tintagel above the nameless graves among the ruins of prehistorical splendour they were not always silent as they walked slowly to and fro among the rank grass or stood looking at those wild waves which came rolling in like solid walls of shining black water to burst into ruin with a thunderous roar against the everlasting rocks 
they talked long and earnestly in this solitude and in other solitary spots along that wild and varied coast but none but themselves ever knew what they talked about or what was the delight and relief which they found in the dark grandeur of that winter sky and sea and so the months crept by in a dreary monotony and it was spring once more all the orchards full of bloom those lovely little orchards of alpine bowcastle here nestling in the deep gorge there hanging on the edge of the hill the gardens were golden with daffodils tulips narcissus jonquil that rich variety of yellow blossoms which come in early spring like a floral sunrise and the waves ran gently into the narrow inlet between the tall cliffs but those two lonely women were no longer seen roaming over the hills or sitting down to rest in some sheltered corner of pentargon bay they had gone to switzerland taking the nurse and the baby with them and were not expected to return to mount royal till the autumn mr tregonell's south american wanderings had lasted longer than he had originally contemplated his latest letters brief scrawls written at rough resting-places announced a considerable extension of his travels he and his friend were following in the footsteps of mr whimper on the equatorial andes the backbone of south america dopsy and mopsy were moping in the dusty south belgravian lodging-house nursing their invalid father squabbling with their landlady cutting contriving straining every nerve to make sixpences go as far as shillings and only getting outside glimpses of the world of pleasure and gaiety art and fashion in their weary trampings up and down the dusty pathways of hyde park and kensington gardens they had written three or four times to mrs tregonell letters running over with affection fondly hoping for an invitation to mount royal but the answers had been in jesse bridgman's hand and the last had come from zurich which seemed altogether hopeless they had sent christmas cards and new year's cards and had made every effort compatible with their limited means to maintain the links of friendship i wish we could afford to send her a new year's gift or a toy for that baby said mopsy who was not fond of infants but what could we send her that she would care for when she has everything in the world that is worth having and we could not get a toy which that pampered child would think worth looking at under a sovereign concluded mop with a profound sigh and so the year wore on dry and dreary and dusty for the two girls whose only friends were the chosen few whom their brother made known to them friends who naturally dropped out of their horizon in captain vandeleur's absence what a miserable summer it has been said dopsy yawning and stretching in her tawdry morning gown one of last year's high art tea-gowns and surveying with despondent eye the barren breakfast-table where two london eggs and the remains of yesterday's loaf flanked by a nearly empty marmalade pot comprised all the temptations of the flesh what a wretched summer hot and sultry and thundry and dusty the cholera raging in chelsea and measles only divided from us by lambeth bridge and we have not been to a single theatre or tasted a single french dinner or been given a single pair of gloves hark cried mopsy it's the postman too eager to await the maid of all work slipshod foot what's the good of exciting oneself murmured dopsy with another stretch of long thin arms above a tousled head of course it's only a bill or a lawyer's letter for pa happily it was neither of these unpleasantnesses which the morning messenger had brought but a large vellum envelope with the address mount royal in old english letters above the small neat seal and the hand which had directed the envelope was christabel tregonell's at last she has condescended to write to me with her own hand said dopsy to whom as miss vandeleur the letter was addressed but i dare say it's only a humbugging note i know she didn't really like us we are not her style how should we be exclaimed mopsy whom the languid influences of a sultry august had made ill-humoured and cynical she was not brought up in the gutter mopsy cried her sister with a gasp of surprise and delight it's an invitation what listen dear miss vandeleur we have just received a telegram from buenos ayres mr tregonell and captain vandeleur leave that port for plymouth this afternoon and will come straight from plymouth here i think you would both wish to meet your brother on his arrival and i know mr tregonell is likely to want to keep him here for some time will you therefore come to us early next week so as to be here to welcome the travellers very sincerely yours christabel tregonell this is too delicious exclaimed dopsy but however are we to find the money for the journey and our clothes 
what a lot we shall have to do to our clothes if we only had credit at a good draper's suppose we were to try our landlady's plan for once in a way suggested mopsy faintly and get a few things from that man near drury lane who takes weekly instalments what the tally man screamed dopsy no i would rather be dressed like a south sea islander it's not only the utter lowness of the thing but the man's goods are never like anybody else's the colours and materials seem invented on purpose for him that might pass for high art well they're ugly enough even for that but it's not the right kind of ugliness after all answered mopsy we have no more chance of paying weekly than we have of paying monthly or quarterly nothing under three years credit would be any use to us something might happen fortune's wheel might turn in three years whenever it does turn it will be the wrong way and we shall be under it said dopsy still given over to gloom it was very delightful to be invited to a fine old country house but it was bitter to know that one must go there but half provided with those things which civilization have made a necessity how happy those south sea islanders must be sighed mopsy pensively meditating upon the difference between wearing nothing and having nothing to wear End of chapter five chapter six part one of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six i will have no mercy on him part one the buenos aires steamer was within sight of land english land those shining lights yonder were the twin lanterns of the lizard leonard and his friend paced the bridge smoking their cigars and looking towards that double star which shone out as one light in the distance and thinking that they were going back to civilization conventional habits a world which must seem cramped and narrow not much better than the squirrel's cage seems to the squirrel after the vast width and margin of that wilder freer world they had just left where men and women were not much more civilized than the unbroken horses that were brought out struggling and roped in among a team of old stagers to be dragged along anyhow for the first mile or so rebellious and wondering and to fall in with the necessities of the case somehow before the stage was done there was no thrill of patriotic rapture in the breast of either traveller as he watched yonder well-known light brightening on the dark horizon leonard had left his country too often to feel any deep emotion at returning to it he had none of those strong feelings which mark a man as the son of the soil and make it seem to him that he belongs to one spot of earth and can neither live nor die happily anywhere else the entire globe was his country a world created for him to roam about in climbing all its hills shooting in all its forests fishing in all its rivers exhausting all the sport and amusement that was to be had out of it and with no anchor to chain him down to any given spot yet though he had none of the deep feeling of the exile returning to the country of his birth he was not without emotion as he saw the lizard light broadening and yellowing under the pale beams of a young moon he was thinking of his wife the wife whose face he had not seen since that gloomy morning at mount royal when she sat pale and calm in her place at the head of his table maintaining her dignity as the mistress of his house albeit he knew her heart was breaking from the hour of her return from the kiev they had been parted she had kept her room guarded by jessie and he had been told significantly that it was not well they should meet how would she receive him now what were her thoughts and feelings about that dead man the man whom she had loved and he had hated not only because his wife loved him though that reason was strong enough for hatred but because the man was in every attribute so much his own superior never had leonard tregonell felt such keen anxiety as he felt now when he speculated upon his wife's greeting when he tried to imagine how they two would feel and act standing face to face after nearly a year of severance the correspondence between them had been of the slightest for the first six months his only home letters had been from miss bridgman curt business-like communications telling him of his boy's health and general progress and of any details about the estate which it was his place to be told of christabel she wrote as briefly as possible mrs tregonell is a little better mrs tregonell is gradually regaining strength the doctor considers mrs tregonell much improved and so on later there had been letters from christabel letters written in switzerland in which the writer confined herself almost entirely to news of the boy's growth and improvement 
and to the particulars of their movements from one place to another letters which gave not the faintest indication of the writer's frame of mind as devoid of sentiment as an official communication from one legation to another he was going back to mount royal therefore in profound ignorance of his wife's feelings whether he would be received with smiles or frowns with tears or sullen gloom albeit not of a sensitive nature this uncertainty made him uncomfortable and he looked at yonder faint grey shore the peaks and pinnacles of that wild western coast without any of those blissful emotions which the returning wanderer always experiences in poetry plymouth however where they went ashore next morning seemed a very enjoyable place after the cities of south america it was not so picturesque a town nor had it that rowdy air and dissipated flavour which mr tregonell appreciated in the cities of the south but it had a teeming life and perpetual movement which were unknown on the shores of the pacific the press and hurry of many industries the steady fervour of a town where wealth is made by honest labour the intensity of a place which is in some wise the cradle of naval warfare mr tregonell breakfasted and lunched at the duke of cornwall strolled on the hoe played two or three games on the first english billiard-table he had seen for a year and found a novel delight in winners and losers an afternoon train took the travellers on to launceston where the mount royal wagonette and a cart for the luggage were waiting for them at the station everything right at the mount asked leonard as nichols touched his hat yes sir he asked for no details but took the reins from nichols without another word captain vandeleur jumped up by his side nichols got in at the back with a lot of the smaller luggage gun cases dressing bags dispatch boxes and away they went up the castle hill and then sharp round to the right and off at a dashing pace along the road to the moor it was a two hours drive even for the best goers but mr tregonell spoke hardly a dozen times during the journey smoking all the way and with his eyes always on his horses at last they wound up the hill to mount royal and passed the lodge and saw all the lights of the old wide-spreading tudor front shining upon them through the thickening grey of early evening a good old place isn't it said leonard just a little moved at sight of the house in which he had been born a man might come home to a worse shelter this man might come home to lodgings in chelsea said jack vandeleur touching himself lightly on the breast with a grim laugh it's a glorious old place and you needn't apologize for being proud of it and now we've come back i hope you are going to be jolly for you've been uncommonly glum while we've been away the house looks cheerful doesn't it i should think it must be full of company not likely answered leonard christabel never cared about having people we should have lived like hermits if she had had her way then if the house isn't full of people all i can say is there's a good deal of candlelight going to waste said captain vandeleur they were driving up to the porch by this time the door stood wide open servants were on the watch for them the hall was all aglow with light and fire people were moving about near the hearth it was a relief to leonard to see this life and brightness he had feared to find a dark and silent house a melancholy welcome all things still in mourning for the untimely dead a ripple of laughter floated from the hall as leonard drew up his horses and two tall slim figures with fluffy heads short-waisted gowns and big sashes came skipping down the broad shallow steps my sisters by jove cried jack delighted how awfully jolly of mrs tregonell to invite them leonard's only salutation to the damsels was a friendly nod he brushed by them as they grouped themselves about their brother like a new edition of leocalon without the snakes or the three graces without the grace and hurried into the hall eager to be face to face with his wife she came forward to meet him looking her loveliest dressed as he had never seen her dressed before with a style a chic and a daring more appropriate to the théâtre francais than to a cornish squire's house she who even in the height of the london season had been simplicity itself recalling to those who most admired her the picture of that chaste and unworldly maiden who dwelt beside the dove now wore an elaborate costume of brown velvet and satin in which a louis quinze velvet coat with large cut steel buttons and mechlin jabot was the most striking feature her fair soft hair was now fluffy and stood up in an infinity of frizzy curls from the broad white forehead diamond solitaires flashed in her ears her hands glittered with the rainbow light of old family rings which in days gone by she had been wont to leave in the repose of an iron safe the whole woman was changed she came to meet her husband with a society smile 
shook hands with him as if he had been a commonplace visitor he was too startled to note the death-like coldness of that slender hand and welcomed him with a conventional inquiry about his passage from buenos aires he stood transfixed overwhelmed by surprise the room was full of people there was mrs fairfax torrington liveliest and most essentially modern of well-preserved widows always dans le mouvement as she said of herself and there lolling against the high oak chimney-piece with an air of fatuous delight in his own attractiveness was that baron de cazalet pseudo-artist poet and littérateur who five seasons ago had been an object of undisguised detestation with christabel he too was essentially in the movement aesthetic cynical agnostic thought-reading spiritualistic always blowing the last fashionable bubble and making his bubbles bigger and brighter than other people's a man who prided himself upon his intensity in every pursuit from love-making to gormandise there again marked out from the rest by a thoroughly prosaic air which in these days of artistic sensationalism is in itself a distinction pale placid taking his ease in a low basket chair with his languid hand on randy's black muzzle sat mr fitzjesse the journalist proprietor and editor of the sling a fashionable weekly the man who was always smiting the goliaths of pretence and dishonesty with a pen that was sharper than any stone that ever david slung against the foe he was such an amiable-looking man had such a power of obliterating every token of intellectual force and fire from the calm surface of his countenance that people seeing him for the first time were apt to stare at him in blank wonder at his innocent aspect was this the wielder of that scathing pen was this the man who wrote not with ink but with aquafortis even his placid matter-of-fact speech was at first a little disappointing it was only by gentlest degrees that the iron hand of satire made itself felt under the velvet glove of conventional good manners leonard had met mr fitzjesse in london at the clubs and elsewhere and had felt that vague awe which the provincial feels for the embodied spirit of metropolitan intellect in the shape of a famous journalist it was needful to be civil to such men in order to be let down gently in their papers one never knew when some rash unpremeditated act might furnish matter for a paragraph which would mean social annihilation there were other guests grouped about the fireplace little monty the useful and good-humoured country house hack colonel blathwaite of the kildare cavalry a noted amateur actor reciter waltzer spirit rapper invaluable in a house full of people a tall slim-waisted man who rode nine stone and at forty contrived to look seven-and-twenty the rev st bernard faddy an anglican curate who carried ritualism to the extremest limit consistent with the retention of his stipend as a minister of the church of england and who was always at loggerheads with some of his parishioners there were mr and mrs st aubin and their two daughters county people with loud voices horsey and doggy and horticultural always talking garden when they were not talking stable or kennel these were neighbours for whom christabel had cared very little in the past leonard was considerably astonished at finding them domiciled at mount royal and you had a nice passage said his wife smiling at her lord will you have some tea it seemed a curious kind of welcome to a husband after a year's absence but leonard answered feebly that he would take a cup of tea one of the numerous tea-tables had been established in a corner near the fire and miss bridgman in neat grey silk and linen collar as of old was officiating with mr faddy in attendance to distribute the cups no tea thanks said jack vandeleur coming in with his sister still entwined about him still faintly suggestive of that poor man and the sea serpents would it be too dreadful if i were to suggest s and b jessie bridgman touched a spring bell on the tea-table and gave the required order there was a joviality et a cla in the air of the place with which soda and brandy seemed quite in harmony everything in the house seemed changed to leonard's eye and yet the furniture the armour the family portraits brown and indistinguishable in this doubtful light were all the same there were no flowers about in tubs or on tables that subtle grace as of a thoughtful woman's hand ruling and arranging everything artistic even where seeming most careless was missing papers books were thrown anyhow upon the tables whips carriage rugs wraps hats encumbered the chairs near the door half a dozen dogs pointers setters collie sprawled or prowled about the room 
in no wise did his house now resemble the orderly mansion which his mother had ruled so long and which his wife had maintained upon exactly the same lines after her aunt's death he had grumbled at what he called a silly observance of his mother's fads the air of the house was now much more in accordance with his own view of life and yet the change angered as much as it perplexed him where's the boy he asked exploring the hall and its occupants with a blank stare in his nursery where should he be exclaimed christabel lightly i thought he would have been with you i thought he might have been here to bid me welcome home he had made a picture in his mind almost involuntarily of the mother and child she calm and lovely as one of murillo's madonnas with the little one on her knee there was no vein of poetry in his nature yet unconsciously the memory of such pictures had associated itself with his wife's image and instead of that holy embodiment of maternal love there flashed and sparkled before him this brilliant woman with fair fluffy hair and louis quinze coat all a glitter with cut steel home echoed christabel mockingly how sentimental you have grown i've no doubt the boy will be charmed to see you especially if you have brought him some south american toys but i thought it would bore you to see him before you had dined he shall be on view in the drawing-room before dinner if you would really like to see him so soon don't trouble said leonard curtly i can find my way to the nursery he went upstairs without another word leaving his friend jack seated in the midst of the cheerful circle drinking soda-water and brandy and talking of their adventures upon the backbone of south america delicious country said de cazalet who talked remarkably good english with just the faintest hibernian accent i have ridden over every inch of it ah mrs tregonell that is the soil for poetry and adventure a land of extinct volcanoes if byron had known the shores of the amazon he would have struck a deeper note of passion than any that was ever inspired by the dardanelles or the bosphorus sad that so grand a spirit should have pined in the prison-house of a worn-out world i have always understood that byron got some rather strong poetry out of switzerland and italy murmured mr fitzjesse meekly weak and thin to what he might have written had he known the pampas said the baron you have done the pampas said mr fitzjesse i have lived amongst wild horses and wilder humanity for months at a stretch and you have published a volume of verses another of my youthful follies but i do not place myself upon a level with byron i should if i were you said mr fitzjesse it would be an original idea and in an age marked by a total exhaustion of brain power an original idea is a pearl of price what kind of dogs did you see in your travels asked emily st aubin a well-grown upstanding young woman in a severe tailor gown of undyed homespun two or three very fine breeds of mongrels i adore mongrels exclaimed mopsy i think that kind of dog which belongs to no particular breed which has been ill-used by london boys and which follows one to one's doorstep is the most faithful and intelligent of the whole canine race huxley may exalt blenheim spaniels in the nearest thing to human nature but my dog tim which is something between a lurcher a collie and a bull is ever so much better than human nature the blenheim is greedy luxurious and lazy and generally dies in middle life from the consequences of overfeeding drawled mr fitzjesse i don't think huxley is very far out i would back a cornish sheep-dog against my animal in creation said christabel patting randy who was standing amiably on end with his four paws on the cushioned elbow of her chair do you know that these dogs smile when they are pleased and cry when they are grieved and they will mourn for a master with a fidelity unknown in humanity which as a rule does not mourn said fitzjesse it only goes into mourning and so the talk went on always running upon trivialities glancing from theme to theme a mere battledore and shuttlecock conversation making a mock of most things and most people christabel joined in it all and some of the bitterest speech that was spoken in that hour before the sounding of the seven o'clock gong fell from her perfect lips did you ever see such a change in any one as in mrs tregonell asked dopsy of mopsy as they elbowed each other before the looking-glass the first armed with a powder-puff the second with a little box containing the implements required for the production of piquant eyebrows a wonderful improvement answered mopsy she's ever so much easier to get on with i didn't think it was in her to be so thoroughly chic do you know 
i really liked her better last year when she was frumpy and dowdy faltered dopsy i wasn't able to get on with her but i couldn't help looking up to her and feeling that after all she was the right kind of woman and now and now she condescends to be human to be one of us and the consequence is that her house is three times as nice as it was last year said mopsy turning the corner of an eyebrow with a bold but careful hand and sending a sharp elbow into dopsy's face during the operation i wish you'd be a little more careful ejaculated dopsy i wish you'd contrive not to want the glass exactly when i do retorted mopsy how do you like the french baron asked dopsy when a brief silence had restored her equanimity french indeed he is no more french than i am mr fitzjesse told me that he was born and brought up in jersey that his father was an irish major on half pay and his mother a circus rider but how does he come by his title if it is a real title fitzjesse says the title is right enough one of his father's ancestors came to the south of ireland after the revocation of something a treaty at nancy i think he said he belonged to an old huguenot family those people who were massacred in the opera don't you know and the title had been allowed to go dead till this man married a tremendously rich sheffield cutler's daughter and bought the old estate in province and got himself enrolled in the french peerage romantic isn't it very what became of the sheffield cutler's daughter she drank herself to death two years after her marriage fitz jesse says they both lived upon brandy but she hadn't been educated up to it and it killed her a curious kind of man for mrs tregonell to invite here not quite good style perhaps not but he's very amusing End of chapter six part one